All right, hey, what's up guys? Matt here from Loon Outdoors, and today we're gonna be tying a cool little uh, PT variant. Um, it's just a small version of a PT. It's kind of a Frenchy, but it does have legs, so it's not as quick of a sinker. Um, so if we wanna jump up on the vise here, I'll show you what I'm using. So I have a, a J20 size 10 jig hook, and I have like a 3.5 mil tungsten bead. Uh, my thread per my norm is going to be some Vivas 50D. So I do a few advanced techniques with this pattern here and I'll explain them as we get into the tie. So we're going to start by just taking uh, pretty darn close to connecting turns all the way down to about the barb you can see. I just like to rest it there. Um, and next up we're going to get our pheasant tail. Now when you're Go into your local fly shop, make sure to select a good chunk of pheasant tail. Now I'm going to want to take like five to six strands off of this. Um, one thing that I like to do, and I'll show you here, is once I feel like they're even-ish, doesn't have to be perfect, remember, <coughs> is I'm going to take a pinch, and that's going to be my tail length. <coughs> so I'm going to take a few turns here, and then double this back over. And this next material is, uh, it's, it's really not a lot to it. It's just called Pearl Quill. Found it online. Uh, seems like it's from the Czech Republic. And they call this brown. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but it has a brown undertone with a pearlish purple um, like hue to the rest of it. So it's a pretty cool material. And I'm just going to tie this on the back side of the fly to create width, not height. So you can see I've just tied it in right there. Next up, I am going to take my pheasant and manipulate this guy. I'm going to use a vice pawn here just to make sure I can hold this out of the way. Kind of makes it nice and easy. And I'm going to go with a wide wrap. You can see I'm flattening out these tail fiber strands, but I'm not building them up. I want to maintain a nice thin profile as much as possible on this fly. So you can see we'll get up front here and I'm going to go ahead and tie those off. And then I kind of shove them into the slot of the bead. Um, that is by design. It's going to help just kind of lock in and uh, you can kind of just tuck everything right in there if you needed to. So this is a really quick, I call them a box filler. So you can see I'm going to take my wraps and I'm going to counter rib this. This is going to add durability. Um, it also does add some flash. Uh, this is a really cool material. I haven't figured out everything that I'm doing with it yet, but it um, seems like there's a lot of solid options. It's a cool, cool little material. So next up, I'm going to grab our dubbing spinner. and. The reason for that is we'll, we'll show you a fun technique here. So I like to take a long dubbing loop on everything. Uh, the extra four inches of thread, you're never going to notice the price or the cost of that. Um, and I'm actually going to wrap this down to where I'm going to build this collar. So the other bonus is, is when you have this, you can set it down, for me, on the table, and it allows me to use the weight of the dubbing spinner to pull tension. Next up, I'm going to apply some swax. This is a low tack variation. There is also a high tack. That's for uh, really sticky situations. I don't often encounter those, but that's maybe bigger brushes. Usually the low tack does it for me. Um, this is kind of a cool dubbing. This is uh, made by John Romer. It's called Diamond Dub. It's very popular. It's very buggy, it has a lot of little protrusions, um, and this one happens to be a PT color, it's color number 18. So I'm going to get this and I just organize it into a nice flat section here. I'm going to take out some of the longer stuff and I lay it down on the table. And if you get dubbing wax all over your fingers, not going to be the best scenario. So 
So next up I'm going to take a partridge feather. Huge fan of partridge. Huge fan of uh, English, English grouse. You could use any speckled feathers. So if you have some mallard feathers, that's going to be fine. So what I do is I just kind of peel off what I want to use here. And I'm going to put that in this little composite loop. So I'm building a micro composite loop for a trout nymph. Um, and you, you know you kind of want them to be even-ish although it doesn't totally matter. Uh, next trick I'll do is I will pick it up with my um, D-loop tweezers and we'll go ahead and put this in the loop here. So you can see it spins a bit and again I can come in here and I can rest this and now I can work this. So I can kind of manipulate and get everything set up exactly where I want it, how I want it. I am going to compress this loop. Um, and loop control comes with time. They do like to spin. So what I'll do is I'm going to trim that really, really, really short on one side, get rid of excess materials. And you can see right now, like I'm going to start and I'm spinning this back over here but there's zero spin on my loop and I'm going to slowly allow that energy to transfer into the loop. What you're going to gain by that is you're going to have a little bit more time to pick out your materials and don't be afraid if some stuff falls out. Not everything's meant to be in there. We go a little bit bigger than we needed to. Not a major issue. brush it out really good. You can spin it one more time if you want. But you can see you're just really formulating this juicy little dubbing loop. What I'm going to use this like is just as I would a hackle. So I'm going to manipulate, fold back, and create this killer little spiky collar here. So it's essentially just a jumbo soft tackle at this point. Get a good wrap on there. Again, I cut where the slot of the bead is. Kind of didn't place my hook properly, but uh, that's my fault. And what I'll do is I'm going to color my thread with a Sharpie. And I'll go ahead and whip finish. Sometimes it's a good idea to let that Sharpie dry, as you can see. Otherwise, it gets all over your fingers. So now what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of come in here and preen this. And I'm going to trim a little bit of a pathway here. And I'm going to push all of those fibers down. And just create a cool little wing case using some thin. So the first, the first bout of thin that I'm doing, that's not going to be my final wing case. I'm going to go ahead and cure it. And you can leave your light on. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, so a lot of people ask me why I put the wing cases on the back of the fly. Reason is, is it doesn't matter. And it gives me a better hook gap in my opinion. So even though you have a jigged fly with a slotted counterbalance tungsten bead on there all of that your fly still will have some rotation and flies and bugs specifically don't go down the river I kinda wanna dome this up so I'm gonna turn it upside down they don't go down the river swimming like Superman they flop upside down left right whatever you wanna think um, so doesn't really matter where you put it, and keeping your hook gap means better hookups, deeper hook sets into a more meaty part of the fish's jaw, and increased landing capabilities. So, there you have it. It's just a little fun variation on a PT nymph, kind of a hybrid soft tackle Frenchy PT type situation done on a jig hook. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.